Hello everyone, today I'm going to introduce you Clip Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. It's based on a simple and elegant idea executed at massive scale. Learn visual concepts by associating images with the text that naturally accompanies them on the whole internet. Before Clip, the bridge between visual and text was shaky and scattered at best. Clip changed the landscape, inspired revolutional models like DALI 2, and democratized multimodal AI by proving that a single model could learn a shared understanding of images and language from web-scale data. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and like. All right, enough said, let's dive into it. The first section is a fractured, frustrating landscape before Clip. Before 2021, building visual AI was a story of isolated successes plagued by fundamental challenges. This section explores the three core problems that Clip was designed to solve, setting the stage for its revolutionary approach. The first one is costly, customized datasets. The dominant paradigm at that time requires huge, manually labeled datasets like ImageNet. This was slow, expensive, and limited models to a fixed set of predefined concepts, creating an artificial ceiling on their knowledge. The second problem is the fine-tuning trap. Models were single-task experts. Adapting them for a new purpose required a full, resource-intensive cycle of data collection, labeling, and retraining. This friction created a high barrier to entry for new applications. The third problem is the robustness gap. Models achieved superhuman scores on benchmarks but failed in the real world. They learned to cheat by exploiting statistical quirks in the data rather than learning the underlying concepts, eroding trust. With all those three problems, here comes the clip breakthrough. The idea is very simple. Clip's elegance lies in a simple idea executed at massive scale. It learns visual concepts by associating images with the text that naturally accompanies them on the internet. These three modules will enable Clip to learn. The first module is Image Encoder, usually a vision transformer, VIT. It processes the image, split the image into different patches, treat them like tokens in a sentence, and use self-attention to understand the global context of the image, producing a feature vector or an embedding. The other part on text is a text encoder. Usually this is a transformer. The standard transformer model processes the text description. It tokenizes the input string and produces a feature vector or embedding that captures the semantic meaning of the text. What is the most critical that bridge the image encoder and text encoder is the contrasted learning. It matches the correct image text pairs. This is the core task. Given a large batch of image text pairs, the model learns to maximize the similarity between the correct pairs while minimizing it for all incorrect combinations. This forces the encoders to place related concepts close together in a shared embedding space. This is how the process works in details. Step one is prepare the data batch. Training starts with a large batch of N image text pairs, where N is 32,768 in the original paper. Assume this batch is B equals to I1, T1, I2, T2, and then I N, T N, which is image N, text N. By the way, the image text pair is relatively easy to scrape. You just go to the internet, go through web pages, and for an image, parse the text that's surrounding them, and then you can use the text and the image as image text pairs. The step two is encode images and text. The image and text encoder process their respective inputs to generate embeddings. An image II is fed through a VIT, producing an image embedding. And for a text encoder, a text caption TI is fed through a transformer, producing a text embedding TI. We now have two sets of vector, I1 until IN, that is the image embedding, and then T1 to TN, that is the text embedding. Step three, it is to calculate the similarity matrix. We compute an N by N matrix of cosine similarities between average image embedding and every text embedding. The goal is to maximize the scores on the diagonal and minimize all other scores. The elements on the diagonal is the correct pairs, that is I1 to T1, I2 to T2, and then IN to TN. And the cosine similarity score can be calculated by this math expression. 
So in order to do machine learning on this, we need to calculate the loss function, and then we need to calculate the gradients, and then we do gradient descent, back propagation, and finally get to optimum. So we need the loss function. That is the step four. The model learns using a symmetric cross entropy loss. We calculate the loss for predicting text from image and vice versa, then average them. The similarity scores are scaled by a learned temperature parameter tau. So loss for a single image i equals to this method expression. WII is the correct cosine similarity score for image i, and then on the denominator is the sum of all the cosine similarities. You should also notice the learn parameter tall is used to rescale both the denominator and denominator better. Similarly, loss for a single text j equals to this, and the total loss for the batch is the total of all the losses for all image and text. And our goal is to minimize this loss function. We can do gradient descent and back propagation to minimize the loss function. After the training is done, the encoders can classify image into new categories without fine-tuning. So you will be able to zero-shot inference on images that you have never seen before. And this is the pseudocode. At this point, the encoders for both image and text are already trained. So let's load image encoder and text encoder. And then when we classify a new image, we first load the image that we have never seen before in the training data. And our goal is to pick the best class labels within a given class label set. So let's create the text prompts from all the class labels. And then we get the image embedding with VIT. And we also get all the text embeddings for all the class labels created text prompts. And then we calculate the cosine similarity, which is basically a dot product. And then we convert the scores to probabilities using softmax function, return the label with the highest probability, and then that is the predicted class label. This is where clip change the game. You don't have to do additional fine tuning, just describe what you're looking for and type your own label, and then you can see how the model classified the image. Now, clip is not just a single success. Clip's success was revolutionary, but it also raised a critical engineering question. If its core strength is creating a shared concept space, must we always build both encoders from scratch? As powerful pre-trained large language models like GPT-3 became available, researchers saw a more efficient path forward. The next leap pioneered by models like DeepMind's Flamingo or Lava and Blip2 that I've gone through in the multi-model overview was not to replace Clip, but to build upon its foundation. The key insight was to ask, instead of teaching new model to understand text, why not take a language genius, a frozen LM, and just teach it how to see images? This led to a frozen adapter architecture, paradigm that keeps a massive LM untouched and trains only a tiny lightweighted bridge to a vision encoder. This unlocks far more complex reasoning with a fraction of the training cost. FIPS architecture is image encoder plus text encoder, and then trained jointly for both encoders. And the frozen successor is frozen vision encoder, frozen advanced LLM, and then the adapter module that is trainable. Note that not all the successor have the exact same architecture. For example, we know DeepMind Flamingo have the cross attention layer and the perceiver trainable, and all the other modules are frozen. And for Blip2, it is exactly like this. We have the VIT and the LLM frozen, but the bridge, in this case Qformer, is trainable. However, for Lava, the VIT is frozen and the projection, which is the bridge, is trainable, but also the LLM have a fine tuning stage. So it's similar, but not exactly the same but they all share the same essence. They are parameter efficient. It trains less than 1% of the total parameters, drastically cutting computational cost. And it also preserves knowledge, avoids catastrophic forgetting by keeping the powerful LLM and vision encoder untouched. And it is also modular and reusable. Engineers can plug and play encoders and LLMs, a familiar and desirable pattern. With this huge success, Clip have a ripple effect. Clip wasn't just a single model, it became a foundational technology. Its ability to create a shared concept space was integrated as a core component in a vast range of more complex and famous AI system. The first example is guiding text to image generation in systems like Valley 2, which is OpenAI's text to image generation model. Clip acts as the essential navigator in a two-stage process. First, the prior. A model takes your text prompt 
uses CLIP's text encoder to understand it and predicts a target CLIP image embedding. This creates a conceptual goal. The next part is the decoder. The diffusion model then takes this predicted image embedding, which is usually in a latent space, and generates an image to match it. CLIP provides both the shared meaning space and the guidance system for the whole process. The second example is semantic search and retrieval. CLIP powers a new generation of search that understands meaning, not just keywords. Users can search for descriptive phrases like a cozy sweater for winter, or even use an image to find visually similar items in a catalog. The third example is zero-shot content moderations. Platforms can filter content by simply providing text description of what to look for, for example, hateful symbols or graphic content. Clip can then flag images that match these concepts without needing a specially trained model for each rule. The fourth one is in robotics and embodied AI. Models like Clipport allows robots to understand high-level abstract commands by connecting language to its camera feed. Clip helps the robot to identify the correct object and execute the task. The fifth one is video analysis. By processing video as a sequence of frames or images, Clip can be used to search for specific scenes or actions within a vast video archive, such as finding every clip that is contains a construction site or sunset over the ocean. The last one is accessibility tools. The principles behind CLIP are core to modern image captioning system that generate descriptive alt text for images, making the visual web more accessible to visually impaired users. And you can imagine CLIP has a rich developer ecosystem. Now, CLIP is not perfect. It's not designed to be perfect, so it has the limitation and biases, and also some solutions. A responsible engineer must understand where these models fail and the societal biases they inherit, recognizing these flaws in the first step toward building better and fairer systems. The first limitation is CLIP can sometimes collapse an image into one vector and discard the spatial data, so it can be bad at counting and doing spatial reasoning. The solution can include move beyond a single vector, methods like region language alignment, fine tune the model to align specific image patches with text. More advanced BLMs use cross attention, allow the language model to look at different parts of the image to answer spatial or counting questions. The next limitation is fine grained classification. Sometimes CLIP learns broad concepts, for example, dog, but misses subtle differences. This is, in my opinion, a little similar with the abstract task. So as you can imagine, the solution can be similar. Other than the previous solution, you can also build better data. The most common way is to fine tune on a specialized data set, for example, for different dog breeds. Like other approaches include using richer tax prompts or using attention-based training methods to force the model to focus on smaller details. The third limitation is compositional understanding. For example, Clip can understand red cube and blue sphere, but not if one is on top of the other. And the solution can be simple, just use better training signals. Methods like click fine-tune the model using programmatically generated hard negatives, which means training it to distinguish red cube on blue sphere from blue cube on red sphere. This forces the model to learn the relationship between your objects and their attributes. The next limitation is out of distribution data. Performance drop on data unlike its training set. For example, if you're trained on web photos, then you probably will perform bad on handwritten digits. And the solution is just to adapt the model. The simplest method is domain adaption by fine tuning on a small amount of data from the target domain. For example, you can fine tune on a very small data set on handwritten digits. More advanced methods like test time adaptation learn to adapt to new data distribution on the fly without needing new labels. And the last one is the accessibility gap. The problem is the model underperforms on data from underrepresented groups like blind and low vision users, failing to recognize important disability related objects and concepts. You can visualize the gap here. The accuracy drop on underrepresented group from around 90% to 75%. So that is a big difference. So how do we solve this or at least close the gap? The first one is data centric solutions. We can fix the source by training on targeted data sets from BLV users and augmenting data with disability related objects and using richer and more descriptive text. The next one is model centric solutions. 
We can adapt the model via domain-specific fine-tuning, use few-shot learnings to teach it new objects on the fly, and apply advanced debiasing algorithms. And the last one is system-level solutions. You can always build smarter applications that allow for user personalization, interactive dialogue for clarification, and community feedback loops to continuously improve the model. I want to end this talk by the path forward from representation to reasoning. Clip learned to create good representations. Frozen models enable basic reasoning. In the future, with models like GPT and Gemini and all the other fantastic LLMs, it's about natively integrated multimodal understanding. The principles pioneered by CLIP are the essential foundation for this next generation of AI, and we're living it right now. All right, hope this talk is helpful. If you like it, please subscribe, share, and comment. See you next time. Bye.